I'm going to go ahead now and share my desktop. I have clicked on my N1MM Logger Plus icon, and uh, I've got this window that's popped up. Can everybody see this window? It says convert existing MDB database or two other options? Yes. Okay. Let's first of all talk about what an N1MM database is. Uh, you need to have one, and you're going to end up creating one. A database is just a container to hold logs. And a log is what you will use during a single contest or event uh, to hold the contacts specifically for that event. Contacts in a log are scored and submitted. So if you work field day again, you'll have a new field day log, you know, next time you do it. So you may have a large number of logs, but with databases, it's really up to you what you want to do. You need to have one. You don't need to have more than that. Uh, and people have different strategies for uh, what databases they wanted. In my particular case, I have uh, hosted a number of club events and uh, entered contacts or entered contests on my own. I have two databases, one that's for AK4AO and one for the club call K4XY. So if I am looking for a, a club event, I can easily find it. But it's completely up to you uh, how, how many databases you want but you need at least one, so let's go ahead and create one. Okay, and this is just a pop-up that says, it's saying reload of the logger something WL underscore country dot dat complete. That's a file that is a list of countries and call signs and it's needed for N1MM. So now, if all goes well, it will create a database for me. So it's created the database, and now I've got a dialog box with a, a red X in it saying, set up your station info in config station. So that's what I want to do next to make it happy. And I will say OK, and I believe it'll take me right into the configuration screen. Oh, OK, it's still creating the database. All right. Uh, the default name is ams, am.s3db. You want to keep the S3DB because that file extension uh, tells it what kind of file it is and it needs to have that stay the same. But I'm going to make the database be called um, AK4AO in my case. But you can keep the, the ham, you can do whatever you like, naming the database as long as you're good. Okay, and it still wants my station info now. Can everyone see the station info screen okay? If you already have an N1MM database, <laughs> because I've been using it for uh, for just regular logging for uh, for several months. I don't see that screen. I have the ability to click on something that says create a new database, but I'm getting a totally different dialog box than what you're showing. Uh, if you already have a database, you're fine as long as you are happy to put the uh, uh, field day log in that database. Yeah, well, that database is full of my own stuff, though, so. Uh, well, the field day log will be one of your own things. That's, that, yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah how, do, so, how, do I, how do I distinguish one from the other or the contacts that are already in there? Uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, you'll set up a new log for this year's field day, okay? And that's what we're going to do after we get past this screen. Now, on this screen, uh, your call sign is mandatory and your ARRL section, Virginia, if you live around here, is mandatory. Everything else is theoretically not required, but I would recommend that you fill in name, your address, state, and, state, and your grid square. And by the way, if you don't know your grid square, just Google Maidenhead grid square and you can find it. And you can change uh, all of these entries later. I'm going to put a Vienna Wireless Society here. I do not believe that this is what they're going to use for aggregation, okay? And I'll talk about the entering your uh, official entry into field day later on, but I think that the screens that you use for that are what will be used to find the Vienna Wireless, but this will uh, cause it to show up in the log that you submit. So can't hurt. I don't think it's needed, but I'm going to put it in anyway. I'm not going to put in my email because it doesn't help with anything. So at this point, uh, I have enough information to uh, go ahead and say okay. 
In my case, I, I downloaded the uh, full install. N1MM goes through versions all the time, you know, like on the order of once a week, because the various versions are keeping up with all the changes and contests and so on. And before too much longer, N1MM is going to offer uh, to update itself. And when it does that, I'm going to uh, come to a point where I can take the update and let it go ahead and do this. And I'll open this up a little bit and see here it is. It says a new version 1.0.8481 is available. Would you like to install it now? So I'm just going to say OK to that and let it update itself. And then I will be up to date. Uh, there will probably be another new version this week. You could take it or late or leave it. Uh, wouldn't hurt to take it uh, when you start up in 1MM uh, before field day. So it's asking me to let it go ahead and I'll just click through that and then finish and voila, I am now up to date. Now this thing that's popping up is going to be a story about what changed in the new version. And that comes up, you know, with, with each release. And you can take a glance at the top and see if there might be something that you care about. And, you know, there are things in packet and UHF and so on. I'm just going to close out of here. As of this release, the program includes features by which anonymous config info from your station is forwarded to the website. This is used for program optimization, such as the live cluster rating system, press OK to opt in. So that's, and it's also saying that uh, it's going to add the CQ zone of five to my configuration. That is the correct zone for me. So. So I'm going to let it do that. Here we are, but before we can really do anything in N1MM, we have another step to do, and that's to create a log for field day. I'm going to go to the file menu and click on new log in database ak4ao.s3db. And that will let me create the field day log that we're going to need for a week from now. So the first thing I need to do to create the data, the uh, log in the database is to pick a log type. And you see right now it's uh, defaulting to log type of DX, which is uh, N1MM's general purpose log that people could use for, you know, casual contacts if they wanted to do that. But we want a field day log, and it's important that we pick the right type of log because that's going to result in screen customizations that are optimized for the field day exchange uh, downstream. If you look right now at the uh, entry window, window up uh, here that I'm pointing to, you see a blank an unlabeled field and then a sent and received and a name and a con comment, right? After we uh, change to a field day log, that's, these boxes are going to change to the things that you need to record for field day. So that's why the log type is important. The thing that you have to know is that the field day type is FD. It just uh, has Foxtrot Delta here. It doesn't spell out field day. It is suggesting a start date of today Field day actually starts on the 27th at 1800. So I'm going to change the uh, start uh, date and time. The 1800 is, is correct. Uh, it's all in UTC. Say so okay to that. So now we want to do the configuration for your field day log. My station is going to be a single op station and it's either single or multi. Bands of all is fine. Uh, my station power is 100 watts. And by the field day rules, that's low, but not uh, QRPs. Now, mode. This is, this is very important that you pick all of the modes that you think you might want to use at field day. If you uh, end up not using some of them, it doesn't hurt. But if you pick this and then wanted to work digital, it would not score your digital contacts correctly. So I'm going to pick single sideband plus CW plus digital, which is, you know, all the modes that I could work. We don't need an overlay. It's not some contests have something called an overlay. It doesn't happen at field day, so you can ignore this field. My station is fixed. It is not mobile or portable or rover. And some contests have uh, specific designations like that that are scored differently. 
Now, assisted typically means that uh, you've used a spotting network or a skimmer. Uh, the field day rules are a little bit ambiguous. I don't believe it's in the spirit of field day to use a spotting site because then you're using an off-site resource to help you make USOs. But it's perfectly okay at field day, and there is no penalty of any sort for setting up your own skimmer for, say, CW, if you have the ability to do that at your site. Or you could actually have a human spotter spotting for phone and CW and so on, in which case probably you're technically assisted, but it doesn't matter because this doesn't matter in the field day rules. There are many contests where there is a separate entry category for assisted versus non-assisted, but we just don't have that here. I'll just leave it assisted in case I want to use a skimmer or whatever. I have a transmitter. I have only one transmitter. Now actually in field day it's simultaneous transmitted signals. So if you have both a VHF and an HF rig, uh, you're still only one transmitter as long as you don't use both simultaneously. And it's suggesting that the SYN exchange might be 1A VA. Actually, I don't think 1A is even possible. I think A requires three people at least. But I'm going to be one Echo VA. Echo is a fixed station on emergency power. And I'm set up here so I can flip a switch in my breaker panel, my generator will come on, and I'll be on emergency power. So that's probably a more beneficial category for me, probably less competition. So I'm going to go as go with one Echo. You folks who are going to be at your home station. Uh, with mains power would be one delta, and uh, the rule books describe the other categories that some of you might be in. Okay, and that is all I have to uh, enter on this screen right now. Are there any questions so far? Yes, um, if I'm not using emergency power, would that be a delta, one delta VA? Yeah, if you're on mains power, you would be one delta. What about the time category, Doug? The time category, it says NA, is that okay? Just ignore that, it doesn't matter. I've never used that. I wonder what it pulls down to. Oh, okay. It's a 24 hour contest, but this doesn't do anything, so. Well, do you have to run two logs if you're running mobile and fixed? Well, that's an interesting question. I imagine that's two entries, I'm not 100% sure. But since those are different categories, I, I think you'd have a score for each. Okay, let's go ahead. I've clicked OK, and now look at my entry screen. All right, it doesn't have as many fields as before, and it has a class and a section. Also, because I told it that I might work phone, CW, or digital, uh, it's offered the available bands and uh, the available modes. And if I wanted to uh, work a different band and mode, uh, I could, should be able to just uh, tell it, oh, it would need, if you do not have rig control, uh, you're done with setup at this point. But if you do have so-called cat control, it's very advantageous uh, to set that up. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, I'll show you how it works for me and uh, we will do a little bit more setup. So I'm gonna go over to config and click on it. It's thinking about it here for a moment. On config, I want the first option, which says configure ports, mode control, wing key, et cetera. I'm gonna click that and bring up the configurer. That's a mouthful. So let's start with hardware. What I'm going to do first is set up cat control. Now cat control allows the uh, software and the radio to communicate. It allows the software to change modes on the radio or, or sense the mode on the radio and, and sense or change the frequency you're tuned to. I happen to know that uh, my cat control that I want to use is on COM4. That's something that you have to determine. My radio is a Flex 6000 series. Then you need to click this button that says set, and it gives you what it thinks are likely the right settings. Uh, let's take a look and see that those are set. 4800 in 82, these are fine. I'm also going to click this box that says push to talk via radio command for digital modes. 
uh, because uh, that will allow it to use cat control to switch the radio and to transmit for the digital software. Let's see, suggested flex settings. So I want to use these, 38.4, N81, always off for these two. Usually the suggested settings will work just fine. ICOM code only is applicable to ICOM radios. And Doug, if you have an ICOM radio, the hex code is 94, 94. Thank you, Mike. If you have multiple radios, uh, you could say this is the log for radio number one. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do uh, set up a station with multiple radios, you set up a copy of N1MM for each radio. And N1MM, if you're working as a team, knows how to combine the QSOs. That's one of the reasons that we use it for a field day when we're able to go to Birch Lake Park and set up four or five stations and so on. Uh, the N1MMs all talk to each other and we get a consolidated log. All right, so I'm going to say OK to this. I am also going to tell you what these radio buttons are because uh, it's possible that uh, somebody might want to try these. Um, Question, Doug? Yeah. Back on the previous screen, screen, there was a choice having to do with foot switch pin six. Uh, maybe that's only for ICOM. I don't know. But do you have any idea which choice we should use if we're going to use a foot switch? No, I, I have never used that. So this is one of the cases where I would, guess, I would say that uh, the N1MM manual is very comprehensive. And that's the place to go when there's something like this that comes up and you don't know what it's all about. It'll probably be well documented there. Okay, thanks. And since I'm on the, the topic of uh, the N1MM manual, there's one other thing that I want to mention to you folks. In the uh, N1MM documentation, there are a number of suggested settings for your Windows PC to potentially optimize performance. And I have not decided to go through all of those settings because it would be pretty time consuming and they're well documented there. There are some circumstances where a Windows computer may go to sleep and lose connectivity on something like the uh, serial port that we just set up. And if you have any uh, issues like that, you should find that portion of the manual and uh, adjust the uh, Windows settings per its suggestions. I haven't personally experienced any of the problems that those fixes solve, so I've elected not to go over that today except to tell you that information is there and it may turn out to be valuable for you. Okay, let's do the radio buttons. Let me say these words in English. Single operator, one VFO, single operator, two VFOs, and single operator, two radios. Okay, so what this does is allow you to uh, take advantage of multiple radios or radios uh, with multiple capabilities. So, uh, Leon, your flex radio has eight receivers and could act like uh, eight radios, but uh, N1MM limits you to two. If you check SO2R, uh, you will have the ability to bring up two entry screens on two different bands, and you can flip back and forth at will. Uh, some contests limit your ability to change bands. Uh, you know, you've got to stay on one band for 10 minutes after a change, or uh, your QSOs, some of your QSOs don't count. Well, Field Day doesn't have anything like that. You can. Uh, uh, switch back and forth at will if you have a radio that will let you do that. We don't need to change anything in function key. I'm going to say OK to this. We think we're good. Uh, but let me just go back to the configurator for a moment. Doug, Tim, okay. I've got a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, under COM ports, I am getting absolutely no choices. I just have none. I assume that's where I'll have to go into the manual and figure out what the problem is. Well, actually, you need to find out how your radio interfaces to the uh, your computer. And what that's telling you is that the uh, computer does not know about any COM ports for interface to a radio. 
So that's your radio manual that you can find out uh, are you connected and have it configured correctly on the radio. Well, what's odd about that is that I work exclusively on FT8. Okay, well, that's strange. I can find the COM port, you know, even with my radio turned off, I believe. My radio is currently on and that COM port is currently active. So uh, uh, try turning on your radio and see if, uh, you know, the way you would for FT8 and see if that port activates and shows up there. Yeah, that happened to me too. I got an error message and I turned my radio on and then it saw my COM port. All right, so turning your radio on may solve it. Don't really need to mess with the function keys. They're, the defaults are okay. Uh, if you want to work digital modes with uh, uh, FL Digi or MM Tiddy, MM Tiddy is for RIDI. FL Digi can be used for RIDI and a number of digital modes. There's setup stuff here. I'm not uh, going to go into that for this presentation because the MM Tiddy and FL Digi modes are not used know that much at field day. Mode control, I am going to set. Uh, because I'm interfaced to the radio, I'm going to tell N1MM to leave the radio mode when it logs a contact as to what the mode is. And for my radio, the correct settings are these. There is a table uh, in the N1MM documentation under mode control uh, that will tell you what settings are appropriate for your radio. So I'd again refer you back to the N1MM manual. I would search for mode control and you can find out appropriate settings for your radio if you're uh, interfaced and, you know, these other settings, um, you know, none of these is you know, really likely to help that much. I don't have those modes uh, under my radio. I got only have lower sideband or upper sideband or RIDI. Yeah, that's correct. It, it depends on the radio what, you know, things are possible. Okay. That's an ICOM 7300, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. So ask Mike Imany. I, same as what you have. It's uh, uh, audio frequency shift key and R. Under, digity, under digital. Okay, and um, what this translate, what this means in English is that if it's, um, it's, it knows that my radio has a lower sideband mode that's specifically set up for digital or uh, other digital modes, it's going to use upper sideband, which from RIDI's perspective is reversed. Exactly. So that's why those are labeled as they are. So we now have a log, we're now configured, and um, we are, you know, in a position to uh, start making some contacts. So let's talk about the entry screen, you know, how to, how to use it. So let's imagine that uh, uh, I pick somebody at random. Uh, I work, um, I skip call history. Uh, let me talk about call history and come back to this. What call history does is allow you to see what the station sent last year if it happens to be in a database that's available to us. Uh, that has to be configured. I know how to do that. First of all, uh, did anybody, well, I know some of you downloaded the uh, call history data uh, that I put up on Ham Community. That's from Vienna Wireless's last two field days. Now it's going to be perhaps of more limited use this year than normally because a lot of those stations are going to be affected by uh, the virus thing. But if you did download this file, slide it here, field day 2020 US text. Uh, the first thing to do is um, move it into whatever directory you used for N1MM uh, pro, uh, non-program files. There should be in here. Oh, that's the program files. I put my stuff in a directory called N1MM Logger Plus. And here's call history files. I'm just going to move it into there, first of all. 
Now, there's also a way to download a uh, standard call history file, and I believe it's over here. Let's see. Okay, I'll have to find out how to get the uh, standard one, but let me go ahead and configure the uh, Vienna wireless one. Um, what I need to do is import that call history file that I downloaded from Ham Community into N1MM's call history database. And I'm going to do that by going to File, Import, Import Call History, and it's going to go to the call history files and I can import this file. If you download the standard one, you can pull down the control key and, and uh, import multiple files and it will combine them. So let me go ahead and say open. It's not really gonna open it, it's gonna load it. Now if I type a call sign uh, that is in the file, automatically pre-populate. So, and I should have found one ahead of time, but let me just quickly find one. Okay, so if I work, I contact W0EAR with call history enabled. Let's see if it's enabled yet. Okay, one more step. I've got to enable it. Sorry. Yeah, here it is. In the configuration, I'm going to enable call history lookup. Okay, so let me start over. And last year he was sending 1B Wisconsin, which probably is what he'll send this year. So if you have call history enabled and you work a station that's in the call history, all you have to do is listen for his exchange. And if it hasn't changed, you can just uh, go ahead and press enter and you've logged in. So that's call history. And uh, I'll remind myself how to get the standard one, let you guys know that. Uh, you use the standard one. It also has some names in it, like it had Vienna Wireless in it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about entering stuff in the log. I'm going to enter a, a new call sign. Let's say that one. And you see that it came up blue. The colors of in which with which N1MM colors call signs are significant. For field day, you just have to worry about two colors. One is blue and the other is gray. If it's gray, it means you've already worked it. In some contests, there are stations that you can't work. So like the, in the ARRL DX contest, uh, you can only work DX stations. Uh, if you put in a US station, that would come up gray to say, hey, you know, it's not that you've worked him, but you can't work him for credit. A gray is somebody you don't want to work. If I try to put in W0 uh, EAR again, you see it's going to turn gray and it's going to tell me that it's a dupe. And by the way, if uh, I tune away from this frequency, it'll erase the uh, entry so far. Okay, well, let's do K6BFA now because there's a few more things to talk about. So I've entered uh, the call sign and it's come up blue, so I know that uh, it's okay to work him. Now I need to enter his class. Well, how do I get to the class box? You know, if in the Windows world, you'd probably think of tab. Actually, in N1MM, uh, the best choice is spacebar, although in this particular case, tab will work too. And let me tell you the difference. There are some contests which have multiple fields, and N1MM is able to default them with very high certainty to the right values. A spacebar will skip over to the first thing that you need to enter, and tab will take you to the next field. Okay, well, let's put Pete uh, as maybe he's 1D, 1D, and let's put him in LAX, say. A couple of things, he got highlighted in yellow, uh, he's also not on a, not in the correct mode, so I should be, so anyway, I've got something to correct, right? So all I have to do is go to the log, double click the erroneous entry, hit enter. So if something goes wrong in your log, that's the quickest way to take care of it. Just go in double click on whatever it is, you know, maybe he's the, maybe you get a section wrong, whatever. 
also because it thought it was ready, it gave it, uh, well, actually it, it gave it two points. Well, okay, it's, it's a point times a power multiplier, I guess is what it came up with that. So we've talked about call history. Hey, Doug, do you get two points for low power? Is that what you're saying? There's a multiplier for power, and the multiplier for low power uh, is two. So you're going to end up getting two points for that guy. If it's on you, if it's on uh, SSB, you only get one. I have it set up for SSB, and it picked that up off my radio. It recognized that. Okay. Uh, and uh, all right, and it gave me one point for that. All right. So I think there's a way to say rescore this guy. Let's see if I can find that real quick. Um, I think it's under tools, but I'm not sure. Yeah, that's probably right. Um, yeah, the second one down. Yep. Or the first one, actually. Yeah. Yep. See, now it's made it one. That's what you would have to do in that case is go back and rescore. Okay. Hey, I just learned something. Okay. So what does the yellow highlight mean, Doug? Okay. Yellow highlight. One of the things that N1MM has in it is a database of call signs that it knows uh, sometimes work that contest. And this is telling you the K6BFA isn't in that uh, uh, database. And if you're a little uncertain about the call sign, maybe you would want to check it, but this happens all the time. So don't worry too much about it. I don't remember how to delete a whole entry. I thought a right click did it, but oh yeah, here, here it goes. If I right click down here, you know, I can get rid of an entry that's just hopelessly wrong. It works if you, if you click on it above the line the same way. Yep. Right, second one down is right click. Yep. Right. Yeah. You have to yeah. click on it, you have to left click it to highlight it, and then you can right click to delete right. it. That's how that works. Okay. What else? If you're in digital and you're not interfaced or it doesn't figure out the mode correctly, you can enter something like PSK and it should figure it out. But um, missing invalid class. Okay, I don't know what that's about. Pretty side band, whatever. So you can manually change bands and modes. You can put in a frequency you know, it'll think you're there. So that's that's one way to change bands and modes if you are not interfaced or you need to. If you are going to have multiple operators at your station and you want to keep track of who made what contacts, type in op on and then type in the uh, call sign of the current operator who's about to make contact. I'm down to a couple of additional windows. Uh, would you go for it when you hit that I was looking at something else and not really paying attention about uh, if another operator comes and you want to log them on? Yeah, log that again. Uh, there are two ways to get into the uh, entry screen for that. You can type OPO in here or you can equivalently type control O. And then you get this dialog box for operator change. And it will then start logging all the contacts with uh, that operator's call sign. There's lots of additional windows in M1MM, and I'm uh, going to let you read about most of those. You're probably going to be interested in your score. So you can bring up the score summary. See, at this point, it thinks I have one RIDI contact, because that's what I told it. That would be a digital contact good for two points. Uh, because uh, there's a multiplier of two, it's going to give me a total score of four. So that'll tell you about your score. Uh, there's another really interesting window that I want to show before I do. Let me see where the thunderstorm is. You know, I think it's safe to connect my antenna. And I'm going to bring up something called the spectrum display. Hey, Doug, for ICOM 7300 users, there may be some discussion here if they don't bring up the spectrum scope like you just described. I'll stand by, but you may, may need to stop for a minute. This window is only available on some rigs. The reason that I bring it up is because it is available on the ICOM 7300 as well as the flex radios. What it lets me do, this is a pan adapter display like you would see on your radio. With the mouse wheel, 
I can set a threshold. Now I've set the threshold to the one signal that I'm seeing out there. And then with shift up arrow, I can tune that signal. It will also skip over signals on frequencies where it knows that you've worked a station. So this is really great for search and pounce. You can uh, work a station and then just uh, shift up arrow and tune up to the next one and uh, work him and carry your way through the band like that. So this is a really nice thing to know about. And I'm going to yield to uh, Mike Imany for a moment and let him tell you a little bit about how to do it on an ICOM 7300. For those of you that have a 7300, when you went to Windows and then you opened up Spectrum Display, uh, did you end up with a blank Spectrum Display, nothing showing? Yeah, yes, that's what happened to me. Okay, so the first thing you need to do is you need to change your baud yeah, rate to 115,200 bytes and to do that, you have to do it in three different places. Okay, so the first thing I want you to do is uh, uh, go to, uh, and uh, hopefully my share is, screen is shared, and you can see my mouse is moving around, and you can see the uh, config, that my mouse is over the config in M1MM, correct? Okay, open up M1MM, go up to configure ports, the first one. And of course, you've configured your uh, ICOM 7300, uh, presumably to a COM port. You've uh, identified the radio. And I want you to hit the word set. And in the speed, in the window, uh, assuming you can see this window, it says, in my case, 115.2. You probably have uh, 9600 or 4800. You need to have high speed. Okay, you may have to turn your radio off at some point here while we do this. So uh, actually turn your radio off uh, and press OK. And when you've done that, go ahead and just check and make sure the setting took. Because uh, I, I found out the hard way that if the radio has the cat control in case, this won't change the uh, baud speed. Uh, so uh, 15 to, and if you got that back, you are good to go. You've configured M1MM for that speed. The next thing you need to do is go to your device manager. Now, the easiest way to find your device manager, and again, I'm presuming this screen is showing up. Uh, I clicked in the bottom uh, search window on Windows 10, and I'm gonna type device manager. Uh, when you do that, you'll get your all your devices. Uh, slide down, these are in alphabetical order, come down to port, and you may have many ports active, but the one that uh, ICOM uses is the Silicon Labs uh, bridge. So go ahead and click that one. By the way, it'll tell you what port you're on. Uh, double click on that one. Again, hopefully the window is showing up. If not, somebody tell me. It so. is. And uh, hit port settings and make sure you have that set at 15, <coughs> 115, to, uh, 115,200. If it's not there, change it. It's a drop down window, find 115,200. Press OK. Okay, how did you get to that spot? Okay, easy to do. I'll do it again. I went down manager. to the Windows search window. This is the easiest way I know to find device manager. And I typed device manager in the little window down at the bottom. That brought up device manager, a window. You could go to settings to get to this also, by the way. Now you slide down until you find the word ports. Open up the Silicon Lab port. Open up the port settings. And I'll tell you... Uh, all the configuration stuff you really need to know. When you were setting the uh, N1MM, you had to know the number of data bits and the number of parity uh, bits and the number of stop bits and flow control, et cetera. They're all on this page. So anyway, those are two of the three things you need to do. Mike, I'm wondering why I'm not seeing ports. I go from because uh, print for the to same reason. Processors. Well, for the same reason that you couldn't see what uh, COM ports were being broadcasted when you were in M1MM. And I don't know how, I, I, when I heard you say that, I was kind of perplexed. Oh, you don't have the radio on. Don't have the radio on, that was it. Okay. So let me see. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's work that offline. Yeah, yeah. But the, yeah. So there's three things you have to do. You have to change the M1MM configurer file for, 100, uh, for a bot speed for the radio. You have to make sure your device port is set up for that same speed. The third thing you do, and I can't display it uh, conveniently, but uh, I need to go to the radio. So when I, I need you to go to the radio, you press menu at the bottom. When you press menu at the bottom, you'll see a bunch of menus. The menu I want you to hit is set, S-E-T. Set is in the bottom right corner, set. Press that once. 
You will get a bunch of things that will start out at the top under tone control, uh, transmit bandwidth function connectors. I want you to press connectors once. Once you've, predict, uh, once you've connected, once you've gotten to connectors, I want you to use the up down arrow until you get to CIV. CIV, it's on the second page. So the first page at the very top starts out with uh, ACC, USBIF uh, output level, et cetera. Uh, I want you to, or I guess actually the first page is ACC, USB output select. The next page is ACC USB IF output level. The third page starts out with data mod, external keypad, and then the third one down is CIV. I want you to press CIV. Okay, when you do CIV, don't get uh, nabbered with the first thing that says CIV baud rate. I want you to go down until you see CIV USB baud rate because you're probably not using a CIV car cord. You're probably using a single wire going between your radio and the uh, computer. So type the, find the USB baud rate and that probably either reads 4,800 or 9,600. I want you to change that to 115 too. When you do those three things, you should have uh, a spectroscope show up. Mike, I, I have one question going back to the N1MM. Yeah. And when we hit set, we're still yep. on the hardware tab and hit set and you get the pop-up screen showing a speed of 115, 200. I notice in a dialog box down below, it talks about uh, icon settings being always off, but mine are showing always, always on. Do I need to change those to always off or does it matter? You no, know, it doesn't. It absolutely matters. They should be always off. Always off. Yep. You know, reading across my screen, I have 115.2. I have no parity, eight bits, one stop bit. Uh, my DTR pin four is off. Uh, my RTS pin seven is off. The ICOM code is a 94. I just have one radio. Uh, I defaulted on uh, 30 microseconds for the uh, milliseconds, excuse me for the uh, PPT delay. And I checkboxed, the only checkbox is PTP to radio command digital mode. Digital and digital. that may or may not be, uh, that's interesting, but that's what I have it at. I have no foot strip, no foot uh, switch, and no radio pulling rate. And uh, that's what I have. So I'm gonna press okay. Uh, I have set all three things. I have a spectrum display that shows what uh, Doug was showing, which was that there's actually signals, at least on the band I'm on, which is 40 meters. And I guess what I should do is I should slide this over here like this so you can see it. So uh, here's my uh, here's my spectrum scope and I've got a signal. I've actually got a couple 40 meter signals in the sideband band. Side band. And, and that spectrum scope only works for ICOM radios? No, it works for everything. Really? Yeah. Uh, no, it does does not work for all radios. It works. Oh, sorry. The ICOM seventy three hundred. It works for the flex radios, and it may may work for some others. Uh, you'd have to check the documentation of N one M M. Yeah, because I haven't been able to get I haven't been able to get it to do anything for me uh, on my ASU. So Problem. A question when you get a chance. Okay. Question. Go ahead. Um, I'm getting an error message that my radio stopped responding. And it tells me to go to my band map and yeah. try to reset my radio. Yeah, what it didn't what it didn't do at this particular point is you don't have all three baud rates the same. Okay, and I have a seventy one hundred. Uh, well, seventy one hundred and the seventy three hundred have the same phenomenology with regards to how they handle the CIV and, and the like. Uh, their mechanism for setting it's a little bit different. Uh, but uh, hold the thought. Uh, that I, I've run into that error. That error was found, uh, uh, for example, I'll get that error when I go back and uh, use WSJT outside of M1MM. So that's what I'm thinking that is. Somewhere between those three settings, what you have in M1MM, what you have in your port setting, and what's on the radio, one of those is different than the other two. Okay. And, and uh, going to the band map didn't help me any. Okay, because 
my uh, 7100 does not offer me a CIV baud rate of 11 or 11 15, whatever. Try going to the largest one you have and then going back to your other two settings and match it to that. Okay. Uh, the, the bottom line, I, I've taken too much time. I think all I really want to say is if you want the spectrum scope to work, you need to up the baud rate. The standard baud rate that we typically use on the 90 on the 7300, which is either 4800 or 9600, does not seem to work. So I think we better move on, Mike. Um, I know. I apologize for taking as much. Well, no, no problem. I mean, I think the spectrum window is a really useful feature, and I'm glad that you were able to help with the uh, 7300 setup because there are a fair number of 7300 users. So I am going to go back and share my screen again. Hey, hey Doug, yeah. before we get off that topic, uh, uh, was that other person trying to set up a 7610? Uh, I don't know. An ICOM 7610 because uh, I've, I've got the manual, uh, the N1M manual opened, and it says for that particular radio, there are additional files required. Uh, I have a 7100, so I don't know if that was your two Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. This was on 7610. It was not 71, so. All right. Well, enough enough on that for now, but uh, certainly I'm happy to take questions during uh, the week, and Mike, I assume you are as well. Uh, if either of us can give you a hand, give us a shout. Yeah, um, definitely. A couple more things before we close. One is, after you're all done, option that you want to use for generating your submission to the ARRL is a Cabrillo file. And that doesn't happen by itself. You've got to ask for it. It's easy enough. And I've got one entry in the log so I can do it. And I just come down here and say uh, Cabrillo file. And it says it's going to assume I'm sending one EVA, which is correct. And we don't need RST and so on. And it asked me to verify all these category things, which the ARRL doesn't care about in your Cabrillo file anyway, but uh, someone, uh, other contests might. Uh, it's going to put it in the export files directory in whatever directory you picked for the non-program files for N1MM. I'm going to save it, and now it offers me a chance to edit it, and I'm going to take that option so you guys can see it. So this is what a Cabrillo file looks like. Notice that uh, under club, it's I have Vienna Wireless Society. That's because I filled that in on that configuration screen. I don't think this is what really matters. I think that what's going to matter for ARRL is the web page submission that you do when you're all done. And there is a specific page on the ARRL website. Uh, in fact, let's see if we can find it real quick. ARL.org log submissions. And that gives me a link. Here is the Anna Wireless Society. So make sure that you have that in your field day submission. And I believe that will be what they will use to aggregate the scores. And it needs to say Vienna Wireless Society, correct? Not VWS or Vienna Wireless. It needs right, to say but it's but it's a pull down. So all you have to do is scroll down to the V's and pick Vienna Wireless Society. Okay, thanks, Doug. Okay, and then you answer a bunch of questions, and then uh, you're going to uh, select the location of your Cabrillo file here, pick that, and that's what's going to uh, get you from N1MM into an actual entry. Okay, now, just uh, some other things I want to cover briefly. I want to tell you about interesting things that are in N1MM, but uh, I don't think we should try to cover in detail. You see all these function keys down here? These are for automated sending of the uh, contest information. A there's a CQ, an exchange, and so on, my call sign, various function keys. That works possibly in all the modes, but would need to be set up. For phone, you can actually generate recordings and have them sent automatically if you have a means to interface your rig so that you can push audio uh, into the transmit. Uh, for CW, uh, you need to have a keying solution. Now, it turns out my radio has a wind keyer emulator built in. I can just configure that in N1MM. 
and I can use these function keys when I'm in a CW mode. You need to, you'll probably need to change the messages. And to do that, one way to do that is to right click on any of the keys and you come up with the current messages and you know edit this and then save it as a file. As you can see for the phone modes, it's looking for WAV files that have the voice recordings. And for the other modes, it will be looking for a text file of uh, what it is to send either through CW or digitally. What I do is uh, get these uh, macros the way I want them, and then I save those away as a file, and I can bring them back and load them up. Again, by right-clicking, I can do file and import and assign a different function key uh, macro file to this contest. So that's pretty handy for uh, the digital modes other than FT8 or CW. We haven't tried it a lot for voice at field day because we feel that having the recording and the transmitted audio when the operator is, is speaking out of sync because you probably don't have recordings for each operator it would be a little disconcerting. But it's something you might want to try on your own because you don't have that issue. Other things you can do, if, you, uh, if you'd like, you can integrate the CW Get CW Reader. There's a, a setup for that. And if you do that and uh, let it start reading your CW, it gives you its own window uh, within N1MM. It colors the call signs with the same color scheme that I told you about earlier. So you can tell if you're listening to somebody you've already worked because it'll turn the call sign gray. And when the exchange is set, it'll pipe it out and you can just click it and it'll pop up into the entry screen. So that can be pretty handy for uh, CW. If you um, run RIDI or PSK, uh, it'll do the same kind of thing with FL Digi. It'll it will bring up FL Digi within and uh, it will apply the N1MM colors and let you click things you know, into the entry screen. However, uh, not very many people work ready in PSK at field day in my experience, but there will be a blue zillion um, FT8 or maybe FT4 signals this year. And so that's the topic for tomorrow. Okay, well, I've kept you for an hour and 20 minutes, and I want to uh, let you go before all of our brains explode. But before I do that, are there any other questions at this point? Quick question. Uh, if for some reason we're not able to get our rig and computer to talk to each other, then uh, you can run N1MM in manual mode. I've done that before. And you have, yes. to, select, you have to select the band and mode and whatever, but, and, it, and it picks like a, a standard frequency, like for, for 20 meters is 14.200. Does the ARRL care if you have the exact frequency uh, for every contact? No, they do not care. All you have to do is have the correct band and mode. So running in 1MM and accepting those defaults is just fine. A question on uh, class and section. How does that get filled in? Okay, well, if you live in Virginia, your section is Virginia. Okay, your, your class is determined by the field day rules, which you ought to download. Okay. Uh, we talked about one delta for a fixed home station and one echo for a fixed home station on emergency power. Uh, if you are going to set up a portable uh, installation, then that would be a different class, and you should uh, read through the field day rules. There are categories for battery power and so on, so you might you, it's worthwhile spending time with the rules to figure out what's going to be best for you. You have to fill those items in yourself for each yes. contact. For each contact. You fill in your partner's class and section, yes. That's what I meant, yes. If you were to uh, do a search on the field day uh, data entry, uh, you'll pull up a, a window that actually has the field day logo on it versus uh, vice the uh, log submission window. It's a little different, but it, it does give you more of a flavor of field day. So if you wanted to try that, uh, it's up to you. One, one more quick question. Uh, how do I get my original log back now that I've got the FD log uh, set up? Uh, within N1MM, you can go file, open log and database, whatever, and you'll go back to you can go back to any log that you already have created. So file, open log in database, pick the database that has it, and it should give you. Ooh, I don't see it. That's it. That's curious. Okay, look at the bottom, uh, open up the file, look at, uh, look, open up file. Yeah. And when you do, 
uh, look down towards the bottom of that pop-up window and all of your last logs will be, if you will, in a list, most recent and first. So after the word yeah, export- they, they both say FD and they both say today. Did you change databases? Did you create uh, a new database? If you did, yeah. you can open your old database by going to file open database. Okay. And there you'll get all your all your databases that exist. Yeah, you can always go back to any of your logs. They don't get lost. File menu and sounds like you're going to need to do open database if you created a new one.